Welcome to the Real Voices Podcast, where we explore the personal journeys of real estate professionals through their own unique challenges and successes. Real Voices is brought to you by Equitable Title and Escrow, providing a better approach to title and escrow through team support and innovative services. This approach delivers a better experience to both agents and their clients. Welcome to another episode of Real Voices. Appreciate you being here today. We have another great guest, Kurt, with Inspections Over Coffee. Yeah. Appreciate you being here, man. Tell us a little bit about your, your business and what you do. Well, I will try not to take too long here, but the idea of the name Inspections Over Coffee, it's a little different than what most people are used to hearing. Most people are called dynamic or awesome or, you know, super cool home inspections. But we wanted to take a little bit of the edge off. Um, let people know that we're going to be speaking with them, not at them, around them, or down to them. Um, and that the home buying process is can be exciting, and the home inspection is always this like treacherous, scary thing. And we thought, listen, we're still going to be super thorough, give you an awesome report, super dynamic, really easy to use, um, but the experience does not have to be so, you know, gut-wrenching. Um, our concept is in three states right now. Um, we have franchised the model. Um, I started the Phoenix franchise, but this is kind of my baby, so I've been doing this for about 15 years, done 10,000 plus houses, and uh, um, one of the things that the real estate world and their clients really like about us that sets us apart besides the kind of the high-touch customer service that we we pride ourselves with is we provided a a $100,000 plus what we call home protection plan in addition to the inspection. So you get this nice thorough inspection, a report that's really color-coded, videos, easy to use, um, but then there's tons of protections for both the real estate agent and the client. So, you know, like a buyer home back guarantee, uh, mold warranties, a regular inspection warranty. Um, there's a whole bunch more stuff. I don't get into all of it now, but there's some marketing we do for the realtors. There's uh, um, recall reports on all the appliances. There's all this extra stuff that most people are not used to getting with just their, their home inspection. So. Right. I, 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 you know, just looking at your business model when I met you a few weeks ago, I thought it was pretty cool stuff that you guys offer. So, yeah, I appreciate you sharing that. So tell me, um, what got you into the business? You've been doing it for 15 years. What? Yeah, it's kind of a funny story. I was in the Navy for eight years. Uh, we did nuclear chemistry. And um, so I had this kind of like uh, um, background in, in that nuclear stuff. And I, I, I got out of the Navy. I didn't pursue that. I, I was in the financial world. And um, I had a small investment advisory, and I'd sold that around like the 06, 07 time frame. And um, I was married, and my so she, now my ex-wife, her ex-boyfriend um, was doing these like what were in Florida were called wind mitigations. And they're basically, if you remember in 04, four hurricanes came through Florida, kind of devastated the whole state. So what happens was if you and I both own a house, the insurance companies jacked up the rates on everybody. So if your house is built better than mine, um, you shouldn't have, you're not as susceptible to damage as my house was. So this inspection basically said um, you can, you, you would get more discounts on your insurance than I would get. And so uh, the state was paying for them at the time. You could do 10 a day. And I think I, I told you before, I, I went from wearing a suit and tie and, uh, um, you know, doing wine tastings to like wearing cargo sh- shorts and a polo and meeting 10 new people a day. And then as that funding ran out, I just started adding in more and more types of inspection types. And um, one of my good friends is an environmental engineer, so we did a ton of work for insurance companies uh, and, and, and um, environmental companies, soil testing, water testing. And um, we slowly progressed. The realtors in Orlando got to know who I was and started requesting that we do their full home inspections. And so um, if I could tell a quick story, the, one of the very first inspections I ever did was for a mortgage broker. So you would think this is somebody who's in the business, they get it, they understand what the inspection covers and what it doesn't. And I was, this, we were new to the, I mean, I knew about houses, but we were new to the, the full home inspection thing. And he calls me two months later and he's all kinds of pissed off. He's calling his realtor, he's all kinds of pissed off. And basically, the house was completely empty when we inspected it. He was there, it's like a 50 year old house. And they went to hook up the washing machine and uh, it, it leaked. And, and I said, well, Okay, I'm sorry about that, but you know, you were in that room with me two months ago, and it wasn't leaking, and there was no washing machine hooked up. And, and he said, "Well, then I went under the kitchen sink and I turned those valves, and and those leak too." I said, "Well, I didn't touch those. I don't. T- the reason it, we there's a reason we don't touch those, and no one's touched them in ten years, and um, they leak. <laughs> like that's the reason we don't touch stuff. Um, and that's actually where the home protection plan came from. Is because after a, a few phone calls and uh, of, of people having bad luck after the inspection, that's really." Nobody's fault. It's just the disintegration of an older home. Uh, then uh, 
um, we, we realize, oh, well, what if people called and we have the ability to kind of help take care of those problems and the realtor doesn't have to stroke a $200 check to a plumber to go fix the problems. That's kind of like the, you know, the, the beginning story, genesis of where this whole kind of thing came from. I appreciate that. Um, I'm always asking, you know, because you work with a lot of agents and you work with buyers on that end. What, what do you think the biggest misconception it is about what you do in particular? So uh, there's, there's kind of a misconception about what is inspected and what's not. People, they look at this home and they go, this is what I'm buying and I want someone to do all the ins and outs. But what sometimes people forget is that if you're an agent and I'm the inspector and, and there's, there's a client, like none of us own that house. So we're actually not allowed really to do anything except conceptually put your hands behind your back and kind of look around. So the home inspection is a lot like going to your, your general practitioner doctor and they check your blood work, and I'm sorry, your, your blood pressure and your heart rate and they listen to you. Um, and then if there's gonna be anything, like that's just kind of a general sense, right? And then anything above and beyond that uh, is this requires a specialist and sometimes specialized testing. So I, most people consider me an environmental expert, but I'm not sitting there testing for mold and asbestos and lead paint on every single home inspection that I, I'm part of. So if I could t- like a, a quick story, like I had a beer with a realtor three, four years ago, and I said, uh, um, he had a whole list of questions, it's kind of funny. And he said, well, if I was going to buy another house, I would want a plumber, an electrician, and a roofer, an environmental, and a structural. And I go, well, yeah, but that would cost you $3,500. So the common misconception is that the home inspector is actually doing electrical plumbing, and we're doing a completely in-depth inspection on every single one of those. Uh, and we're not. What we're there to do is we're there to go, hey, instead of you hiring all 11 of those people, we're here to tell you that nine of those areas are fine, and here's the two you do want to hire. And yes, the plumber goes deeper than where we go, and the environmental goes deeper than where the home inspector went. Um, and, the o- and, and we should almost always defer to the electrician or the plumber or the, the structural. Um, the only time I, I say that that's a caveat, the exception to that rule, is when they show up with their big truck and they scare you and they go, well, this whole thing's got to be completely replaced. I've seen an electrical... <laughs> plumbing, uh, HVAC, sometimes it's just a $100 fix, but they want to b- sell you a $7,000 electrical panel, and you're like, well, really, that should only have cost like two twenty five hundred, three grand, you know, whatever the case may be. So that's the misconception is that we're, we're the end-all, be-all. Like, I guess the best way to simplify that is to say that we're the, really the beginning of your due diligence, not the end of your due diligence when you're looking to buy the house. You may have to bring in a roofer, a plumber, an environmental person. So that would be... That's the short answer. I appreciate you saying that. Um, you know, I did lending a long time, and it always did feel like the inspection was the end, right? Especially as loan officers, you're like, okay, the inspection came back, you're good. Now we're doing the appraisal. That came back, good, okay. So, yeah, I, pre- I appreciate It's kind of like if you were helping your niece buy a car and the transmission was making a kind of a weird noise. So the person who you took the car to have a look at it is a general mechanic. And he or she says, yeah, the transmission's acting a little funny. Well, what do you do then? You then go to the transmission specialist who then can give you further answers. So that's really the best way to think of the inspection process as a whole. Cool. Thank you for sharing that. You mentioned being in the Navy. Um, what, what took you down that path? What, what was life like before then? What? Well, I, I joined when I was a couple of months over 17, so my parents had to do the thing where they <laughs> sign you away as property. Um, I was probably one of the youngest people to ever get through the Naval Nuclear Program, um, which is at the time considered like the second hardest um, school system in the in the, in the U.S. behind, just behind Harvard Law is what the, what the rumors were. Um, but I mean, I was 17, I, I was bored with school, I didn't think college was going to be a good choice for me, and um, I just thought that having the, the discipline, and, and I, I mean, I was good at math and science, but even in school I was like, it's kind of boring, I don't need to do that calculus thing 25 times, I just do it one time and we get it and that's it. So um, the Naval Nuke Program is basically like a fire hose of nuclear information. They basically give you the equivalent of a nuclear technology degree, nuclear engineering degree, somewhere in the middle there, um, in about six months. And then you go to the prototype school and you do another six months where it's all the hands-on work. So it's a lot, which, I mean, I liked it, though. Wow. But doing it at 17, you know, fun. <laughs> God, thank you. So um, as a kid, you know, growing up, what, what, what inspires you? What do you think you'd be when you grew up? I thought I was for sure going to be a professional soccer player. I, my parents said no. <laughs> I went to a tryout with the U.S. national team when I was like 13, and I got invited to go play in Europe for the summer. 
And um, all I had to do was, it wasn't a lot, this was in the 80s, it was like uh, uh, $1,500 and I, I could sell candy bars. My parents just said they squashed that. So as I was getting out of the Navy, I did get a tryout with uh, um, what at the time was called the A-League, which was one level below the MLS. Um, but I mean, I hadn't gone through the college ranks and all that kind of stuff. So it was nice to get the tryout, it didn't work out. And uh, when I realized that those guys make about, it, again, back in the 90s, make about $1,500 a month during the, the months that they actually play. And I was getting out of the Navy with two kids, so I was like, yeah, that's not gonna work no matter what. Even if I was good enough, it wasn't gonna work out. <laughs> wow. So to answer your question who inspired me, pretty much I loved all sports, you know. Loved uh, Brett Favre and Magic Man, Mika Don Mikowski growing up, and uh, at, back then Jordan, and, and anything sports related. Cool, cool. Um, you know, still kind of keeping back with the, the childhood, um, you know, when you were a kid, what, what would have been the, I guess, the most interesting way or unique way you've ever earned a buck? So I have some interesting ways that I've earned money and not all more appropriate for, uh, <laughs> no, no, no. So I have two interesting ways. One is, uh, my very first job, my dad went to the, to the paper route, paper station where because of the Boy Scouts, we knew the guys that were like a little older that ran the, the, it. And, uh, he lied and said, you're going to, to the Malloy brothers, Kurt is 12 and you know it, and you're giving him a paper route. So he lied about my age when I was 11 so I could illegally get a paper route and make money. But then I was going to say the second way was, you know, in the Navy, here I am like 19 years old, I get to sent out to an aircraft carrier and I got to what's called, uh, sent to a, a pre-commissioning unit. So I was part of the commissioning of the John C. Stennis and the Harry Truman, but here I am 19 years old doing like nuclear you know, testing uh, chemistry stuff on a, on a um, you know, on a, on a, on a, a nuclear uh, aircraft carrier that's being built. So I would say that even though it's not a lot of money, the military doesn't pay a lot of money, um, that's an interesting way to make yeah. money. <laughs> I appreciate you sharing because a lot of times I ask that question and people are thinking about those, you know, interesting ways. But I think that is, especially when you mentioned that you were doing nuclear science stuff on that. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, we would test the chemistry and normally... When the aircraft carriers just out to sea, it's very steady state. It's very simple. You just do your routine testing. But what's cool is while they're being built, you have to do all of these like different metallurgy type tests to make sure all of the pipes and the pumps and everything are, are working just right, which called for completely different levels of chemistry, which I had no part in figuring all that out. I wasn't that smart guy, but I, we were the guys that did all the chemistry and made sure that it was met up to whatever the engineers had developed. Interesting. So, and what, as it's being built, are they, is there actually nuclear material on it at that time? Or so all that, of that's that? done, yeah, before we get there, before wow. any sailors get there, you know. But the way that uh, it, the Newport News Shipyard builds them is they think of them like huge Lego blocks. So they actually over, they got the, the, the ship here in the, in the bay, and then they're building these blocks, you know, that are maybe, you know, call it, I don't know, 50 by 50, with all of the piping, all of the electronics, all of the electrical, and then they pick it up with the biggest cranes in the world, and then they plop it in, and then the welders and the electricians go in and start connecting it all. But yeah, so the, there's two reactors on, on those carriers, and those are like the first things that are there before any, any Navy guys are there, or gals. Yeah, that's pretty cool, man, pretty amazing. Um, so you didn't make a career out of it. What, what were you thinking, just staying in for a few years and been done or something changed while you were in there? Uh, I just never had the intention of being a lifer. Um, you know, I, I, there was a lot of opportunities. I mean, <laughs> I'll tell a funny story. So people go, oh, the opportunities, you get to go to the Mediterranean and, you know, and I'm like, yeah, and get off the ship and you get to hang out with 4,000 of your best friends who are <laughs> drunk, horny, and belligerent. <laughs> and I said, I'd rather just get out, save up $5,000, and I'll go on my own without my 4,000 friends. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. I you like know. It. Right. I like that. Thank you for sharing. I appreciate that. Um, you know, is there anything that you regret in life or anything you change? Uh, you know, I tell my kids all the time, I got out of the Navy... Um, and the way the military works is there's an American College of Education, and they will look at your experience um, in really anything, but the military especially, and they give you basically college equivalents, and you can take these equivalents to a uh, to any you know uh, you know university, and they will pick and choose which ones they're going to give you credit for. So a lot of my buddies um, got out. Well, right before they got out, they could clep all their lower level stuff, and then they had about six months worth of work that they, uh, and they got their degree. So I always tell my kids, I wish I would've got my degree. Because basically, 
coming out of the military, the, the American College of Education said that I had the equivalent of almost like two master's degrees, like 186 credits or something like that, because I think it's 120 plus 30 plus 30, something like that, right? And um, But there's been a few times where even though I've got all the background, the education, whatever, and that's helped me, you know, I've had certain states waive your licensing and go, well, you clearly know what you're doing. Uh, but there's other times where I, I wish I would have had that degree, just that piece of paper that said, uh, yeah, you know, you're, you're good. So that's probably my biggest uh, thing. I should have done that when I was young. Just that paper, right? But, you know, two kids, 23, 24, and I was very busy. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely understand that. So thank you for sharing that. Um, so, you know, Navy, I'm just thinking about how crazy those things could be at times. What would be the craziest, most outrageous thing you've ever done in your life that you feel is appropriate sharing? <laughs> yeah, I'll give you the fourth most crazy thing I've ever done. How's that? Um, no, there was funny. I did port several times in. Uh, um, um, well, the crate. Yeah, I did port several times in the uh, in the Caribbean, and one of the times I made friends with like both a waiter and a waitress, and they were locals, and we were just having a good time, and they like whisked me away, and I'm on the back of the island, and I'm hanging out with all these locals that are all my age, and they're kind of like a little bit like the island of misfit kids. They, they all have crazy stories, and I'm literally sitting in this house with like 15 people, you know, having some beers, and, and, do, and I'm like, I could disappear and nobody would know where I'm at. But these kids had like the craziest stories, you know, this one girl was like giving up for adoption at like 13, 14, you know, and you're like, you know, we know that those things happen, but when you're sitting across from the person when they're like 20, and you're like, oh my God. So that was a, I still remember sitting in that house, and then what was crazy is we stayed up all night, the sun's coming up over the backside of the mountain, and... Um, you're like, dude, there's like four of these kids like just renting this. They, they wait tables every day and then they, they, they pay the rent. And you, the sun comes up. It's the most beautiful like scenic beach thing you could ever imagine. And you're like, maybe they're not the misfit kids. Maybe they're the ones that got to figure it out, you know? And um, next thing you know, I, I, I get back to the other side of the island and all my buddies are like, dude, we were all freaked out. Where were you, man? <laughs> so, oh, man, that's you know. cool. Yeah. I think it's always interesting meeting new people and seeing that your life wasn't as bad as you, you thought, right? It's, yeah, right. It's, it's always not as good and always not as bad. Right, right. <laughs> Very true. Very true. Always room either way for it to fall apart or get better. Very true. Um, so tell, tell us about the, the book you brought here. Um, looks like something about Kobe Bryant. Well, you asked me to bring a book, yes. and I said I'm a bad person to ask what my favorite book is because I love books and um, as I got older, it's the, the, you know, the reading vision is not as great as it used to be. Um, I have lots of favorite marketing books and business books and all that, and I didn't want to do anything cliched. So I brought uh, the one book that sits on my, my uh, coffee table, and it's called The Mamba Mentality by Kobe Bryant, which is uh, um, interesting. I mean, his anniversary of his passing was just like a day or two ago. Um, I, think, I don't think anybody has anything bad to say about Kobe Bryant, but he does talk about the mama mentality here. I know you wanted me to read a passage. So he said, uh, initially I thought the phrase mama mentality was just a catchy hashtag that I'd start on Twitter, something witty and memorable, but it took off from there and came to symbolize much more. The mindset isn't about seeking a result. It's more about the process of getting to that result. It's about the journey and the approach. It's a way of life. I do think that it's important in all endeavors to have that mentality, which I love, right, because it's never... Look, you can have, it's like a golf shot. You can hit it, you can do a perfect swing and get a really bad uh, outcome, but it, it's about the swing, it's about the process. And whether it's work or life or, you know, whatever, you know, I think it's, it, I mean, I used to do Ironman triathlons and, and it, the race itself is pretty easy, like all things considered. It's, it's always the months and months and months of, of training and process to get there. And I think that's true whether you're building your business or helping a client, or help, buy, you know, the process of buying a house. It's like the, the journey, you know, it's never the, the final end thing. So yeah, I appreciate you sharing that. I, I really do believe that that's how we find our, our happiness and thankfulness is in the journey, right? Not mm. trying to get to the end of it. So thank you. I appreciate it. So where can people find you? Where, where can they? Uh, if you go to inspectionsovercoffee.com or uh, my email is Kurt, C-U-R-T, at inspectionsovercoffee.com. Um, Inspections Over Coffee is, uh, you know, all the normal social medias, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Um, I try to say we have this, we don't have luxury prices, but we have like a luxury sense of, of customer service and, 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 you know, differentiation and just, you know, uh, you know, we used to have this marketing message around like this hero thing where we would, we would make the real estate agent look like the hero to their client because they, they chose us. And then we want the client to feel like a hero with the amount of information that we give them in the process of buying a house. 
So that's really our, you know, our big, uh, our big, like, listen, we're here to, it's not about our big pants or our NBA referee. It's about, you know, you, your client getting the knowledge they need to move forward with their house. Again, I appreciate you coming on. And, uh, you know, as I said earlier, just looking at your product, I've been around business for about, you know, 15 years or so, and it's a different, so. Cool. Different in a good way, that. so. <laughs> thanks for coming on, man, appreciate it. Yeah, thanks. Thank you.